An old man goes every day to pray to a church in the Spanish city of Caceres to pray for Irishmen who died 40 years ago. A flag flutters over the Barrow Valley and another old man in the uniform of the Irish Brigade of the Spanish Foreign Legion hoists the flag of Spain and remembers a war in another valley a thousand miles away and 40 years ago. that I would fire would be a bullet against the Dublin capitalist class and the uh, slum landlords. Well, I bear them not the slightest animosity, but I still cannot find out how they could have a legitimate reason for choosing Moscow as their master when I selected Rome as mine. Well, yes, priests were murdered, bishops were shot, churches were burned. But this happened on both sides. Yes, of course, it was sad, of course, from that uh, point of view, to feel that uh, there was a couple of hundred of them there, but uh, the honour was on our side. I think that we were fighting for Christianity, and they were fighting for the, dis for the disestablishment of the Catholic Church. That when you walked into this war, it was not a little war. It was a, it was a, a big war being fought in a big way. For the whole of Europe and in Ireland too, the Spanish Civil War was a war of fierce passions. Democracy was under attack by a rebellious army aided by the fascist powers, or the church was being crushed by the forces of Antichrist. Between these two ideologies, there were a thousand shades of black and white and gray and red. And Irishmen fought and died on both sides in Spain. An olive grove in the Harama Valley, south of Madrid. Nearly 40 years ago, two great armies fought over this ground. And in 10 days of vicious and bloody fighting, 45,000 of them were killed, including 22 Irishmen. One of them was Charlie Donnelly, the young Armagh poet. He and his section had run for cover into an olive grove. And Donnelly bent down and picked up a bunch of olives. He squeezed them and said, even the olives are bleeding. A minute later, a bullet hit him in the head, and he's buried now beneath those olive trees. The 30s were the years of the blue shirts in Ireland and they brought in their trail bitterness and strife and bloody street battles in Dublin and elsewhere. Their origins were in the Army Comrades Association, later to become the National Guard, founded in 1932 by former Free State Army men, most of them Civil War veterans. By 1933, the association's membership and influence had spread throughout Ireland and they had adopted the blue shirt uniform. The last few days of the general election, in the 1933 elections, the blue shirts were the self-appointed guardians of the coming ale meetings, and at many, they left broken heads behind them. They marched as soldiers, and their declared enemies were Republicans, who their leaders proclaimed were communists. They saw reds round every corner, and indeed, they were encouraged in this hysteria by the pastorals of many a bishop and the preaching of many a parish priest. The Friends of Ireland will rejoice with us. It was a witch hunt which was condemned by Eamon de Valera and his new Fianna Fáil government. And in 1933, the Blue Shirts got a new leader. I must apologise to you for having to read my speech. I have to appear in the dock on next Tuesday and I must be very careful that I'm not taken up by some local secretary of Fianna Fáil for contempt of court. <laughs> In the last General Owen O'Duffy, a 
former Deputy Chief of Staff of the Free State Army and for 10 years Commissioner of the Garda Síochána until he was sacked by de Valera in 1932. O'Duffy was a man of action with a flair for publicity and some organisational ability. He had moulded the Civic Guard into an instrument of government and had helped organise the Eucharistic Congress in 1932. Now he was to take over the leadership of the Blue Shirts with their new constitution full of pietistic zeal and newly opened not just to ex-soldiers but to all Irish Christians. Within weeks, O'Duffy was virtually the leader of the opposition to Fianna Fáil and de Valera banned the blue shirts. The National Guard is strongly opposed to anything flavouring of a dictatorship. Or a they lasted until early 1936 under a variety of names, but their power was really broken in 1934 by internal dissensions caused mainly by O'Duffy's personality and lack of political experience, by the Fianna Fáil ban and possibly by losing street battles. To support the National Guard in reaching the goal of Griffith, Collins and O'Higgins. O'Duffy went around Europe attending fascist congresses and dreaming of the ideal of the corporate state. Until he got the call in 1936 to form an Irish brigade to fight for Franco in the Spanish Civil War, which began in July of that year. It was an invitation which appealed to everything that was romantic and crusading in O'Duffy's restless nature. The war in Spain was begun by an army revolt led by General Franco against the left-wing Popular Front government which won the 1936 general election. Since February of that year, there had been riots and church burnings and assassinations, and the forces of left and right were gathering strength. On the right, the sternly authoritarian combination of church and army, and the Falange, the Spanish fascist party. On the left, the legally and democratically elected Popular Front, socialists, liberals, communists, trade unionists, anarchists. In mid-July, Franco and his Moorish troops were invading Spain from North Africa, and military governors in different parts of Spain declared for one side or the other, the bulk of them joining the forces of rebellion. Three years of cruel war had begun. It was a war which was to involve most European nations, a war which for the first time was to see the use of air power against military and civilians. It was to be a war of incredible bitterness, of appalling acts of viciousness on both sides, a war of great heroics and idealism. It was a war which was to illustrate once more the furia española, that cruelty in the Spanish nature, as old scores were fearsomely settled. It was a war which lasted until March 1939 and the fall of Madrid. For Franco, Generalissimo and head of state, victory without generosity and a terrible revenge. Thousands were executed. A million were exiled or imprisoned. But in 1936, Irishmen were preparing to go to Spain. Some to join O'Duffy's brigade and fight for Franco, others to join the International Brigade and fight for the Republic. Terry Flanagan, former bakery worker, wounded near Madrid, 1937. Today, a public relations man. In 1936, a member of Ser Era. We had been reading for a couple of months before I went out there of this democratic republic being assailed on all sides by Hitler and Mussolini and Franco. And being a Republican, I thought it would be a dreadful thing that if this Republic went down without me giving one helping hand to save it. Joe Monks, Dubliner, now working in London, wounded at La Pera, December 1936, a former member of the Communist Party. And those of us who had gone through the 30s and unemployment and so forth, I knew the um, <coughs> want that came in the wake of the great slump in 1929 <coughs> were very enthusiastic at seeing the working class as the ruling class inside a Western European state. 
Frank Edwards, a school teacher from Waterford, one of the first to go to Spain with Frank Ryan, wounded at Las Rosas, not far from Madrid, a member of the Republican Congress. Here were Duffy's, uh, Duffy's swashbucklers going off to going off to Spain to to fight fascism, and we felt that was the only way to the only place to fight him was there, since it was impossible to do anything. We felt come completely frustrated and uh, no hope of mounting any kind of resistance to this overwhelming wave of fascism. Bob Doyle, Dubliner, now a shop steward in London, captured on the Aragon front with Frank Ryan, 1938. I thought that uh, with the struggle going on there and the support of the Martin Murphy press, who owned the press, of course, and of course the Dublin tramways at the time, that these were heavily on the side of the Franco, uh, of the generals in Spain, right from the beginning. Alec Diggs, Dubliner, now living in London, former secretary of the International Brigade Association, went on to fight the Germans in the Second World War and lost a leg. We, we went there rather failing, to be quite honest. It was a bit of a suicide mission, but, uh, well, we were young and idealistic. I don't mean in a blue-eyed sense, but for, in the good sense of the word. And so it seemed the logical thing to do, so we went. Michael O'Reardon, General Secretary of the Communist Party of Ireland, wounded on the Ebro, 1938, has written a history of the Irish in the International Brigade. I decided to go to Spain because I saw the Spanish struggle as a continuation of the struggle here, and I saw it as a universal struggle in the wars of one of the champions of the Republic in Spain. I'm quoting a priest now for a change, uh, Father Michael O'Flanagan, uh, that it was a war of the rich against the poor a brutal war of the rich against the poor. And therefore, one's duty was to assist the poor, uh, since they were receiving no assistance from anybody. Paddy O'Dare, Donegal man and battalion commander with the International Brigade, now living in Wales, spent two years in Spain. Well, all causes are worldwide anyway. Freedom is indivisible, isn't it? And uh, if... Uh...